Uh, Shannon's family origin originally is from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, she grew up in the south suburbs in Olympia Fields and went to Homewood Blossmore High School. Woo -woo. I don't know. <laughs> um, her dad is a small business owner and her mom is a working professional. Yes, she has a brother and a sister. She describes her upbringing as never going without. And while she acknowledges that there is privilege in her childhood, it's relative to the community that she is a part of. Uh, Shannon is a girl people know, but don't know. Yes. <laughs> so tonight, we want, to get, we want to get to know Shannon more, for at least what she allows us to know about her. <laughs> of course, right? Um, you're proud of the resilience of your family history. And I marked 1790. 1790. All right. So um, that's when you were born. I was. <laughs> yes. yes. It's all funny games. Picture of my closet. Um, but um, yeah. So um, me being an um, an African American woman, our our family lineage has a tendency at times to have this cutoff, right? Like we. Um, don't have the luxury and the privilege of being able to go way, way, way back, right? So like these, I don't know, Charlemagne, you know, you know, you know, all that other stuff, right? But um, due to a lot of oral history in our family, we're able to actually go back to 1790. We kind of hit a wall there. Um, he was a slave in South Carolina. His name was Stanford, um, and he was sold to, um, I believe he was sold to Mississippi at first, and he was sold to New Orleans. And what's so amazing about that is the plantation is still standing, <laughs> which I've actually visited. Um, I know where he was auctioned at. That's there. Um, so it's actually really amazing. And um, I guess that's just something that's just such an honor for me to be able to really tie into. Yeah, and you talked about it as like bringing honor to your veins. Yes, yes, yes. I always say, um, when we talk about inherited traits, right? We're very quick to say, oh, I've inherited my mother's bad eyesight, and I inherited my father's diabetes, and high blood pressure runs in my family, but we don't ever lay claim to all of the resilience that flows in your veins as well, right? Um, we don't lay claim to the fact that in your veins lies the blood of survivors who survived a hellish prison trip and were unleashed into a burning prison and they survived that, and they survived Jim Crow, and they survived segregation, and they survived war and plague, and famine, and whatever else. So for you to lay claim to all of these negative things, my like, God, turn it around and lay claim to all the things that actually keep you sustained and alive, you know? Okay, got it. All right, I guess just have to do something. <laughs> um, there was, yeah, thanks. Uh, you never said you were gay, you never said you were transgender to your family. And you said that you always knew. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit about going down the staircase at 16 years old. Um, yeah, I was kind of like that character on a TV show that goes upstairs and just never comes back down. Um, <laughs> I just wonder what happens to me. Um, but no, really. Um, yeah, I was, I was coming down the stairs, or our staircase goes this way, and my parents were kind of sitting where you all are. So I'm coming down the stairs, and my mother and father were just watching TV, and they look, and quotes, and quote, my father goes, boy, you like a girl. And my mother said, what are you doing? <laughs> so I, I got excited, so I'm like, oh my god, this stuff's working. You know, <laughs> you know um, taking, I, I got my first shot, actually, at estrogen, um, from a Latino woman, um, Latino trans woman named Blaine. Blaine, I haven't seen Blaine. Right in the little village. She lives out. It's a long time ago. Won't tell you how long. <laughs> no, 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 she was a Latino woman. Yeah, um. Alright, I'm doing the interview. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, with that being said, you know, opposed to freaking out, which my parents did. Um, they were more concerned with, well, what are you taking and what is this doing to your body, right? So, 
I was actually sent to the one and only doctor I've had since I was 17, Dr. Edmund Miller. So essentially, I'm still in pediatrics. <laughs> I was about to say that. Um, and I've been under a doctor's care since. Yes. Well, one of the things, I mean, like, things don't happen like they do in the movies, right? Like, several things lead up to uh, a moment. So sometimes we see that, that one moment, there's like that one coming out story, and it never really happens that way. You just said right now that you had taken your, you had started taking estrogen. It was like your first shot, and you described it as your first shot. Yes. Um, and I've heard that before. Can you explain to people who don't know why, quote unquote, the first shot is important? Um, because it's, it's, it, it is the first step to moving towards being proactive about um, your identity, right? Um, a lot of times, this community has a tendency to think of estrogen as being a massive magic elixir opposed to actually real deal medicines. Um, but again, it was just something that was like, yes, like I'm actually going to see tangible change happen to my body. Um, so it was just kind of my declaration of independence that's so cheesy. But um, yeah, basically it was just kind of my declaration to myself saying, you know what, this is what you're gonna do and there's no going back. And while you describe your parents as good parents and being supportive, maybe not, but you describe them as tolerant. Yes, so I had parents have that were more so um, tolerant. Tolerant in a, God, it's funny, because you know what somebody said? My mother would actually be here right now if I told her. She'd be like, oh, why didn't she tell me that you were doing this thing? Um, I didn't, you know. <laughs> I forgot. Oh, oh, I, no, I forgot to tell <laughs> We had some good food. There's still food left over. She <laughs> looked like talking about her about the pressure of post But anyway, um, what was that? Oh, tolerance, right. So here's the thing. My parents, God bless them, look at being transgender as an unfortunate state of being. It's just like, oh, for you, that is how you were born in. It's kind of like being born Down syndrome or being born with any other type of disabling condition. Bless your heart, we couldn't help this. And, well, let's help you do the best that you can under the unfortunate circumstances that you're in. I'm going to tell you something, though. That was better than what could have been, you know? And I capitalized on that. I'm like, well, mom, since me and my unfortunate stuff can do so much, these shoes are like really cute. Help me in my unfortunate condition. Right? You know, like, there's no cure for my dysphoria, so let's go shopping. <laughs> so, you know what? It works. It worked. And here's the thing in life, I've learned to see intention opposed to action, right? And my mother, growing up in the segregated South, in a Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal background, you know what? That's amazing for her. That's amazing for her. And then I honor that. And I honor that that woman is my friend. And she's one of my best friends. That um, we trade shoes. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's what it is. I love that. Let's give it up for your parents, right? <laughs> Again, that's laying, that's laying claim to that resilience that's inside of you, you know. So that's what I do as a provider, is that I help individuals tell the world what their name is, as opposed to other people telling it for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you said that you love and admire the young people of today who are so brilliant in expressing their desire to not conform to the binary. 
Uh, can you expand on that? And I, I was kind of talking to Mayo about this, and in the short amount of time between when I graduated from high school and now, it's short. <laughs> the things, it's short. <laughs> things were a lot more binary, right? You were going to be a boy, or you were going to be a girl. I knew I wasn't wearing a tuxedo. You know, I knew I wasn't um, putting the corsage of any girls, whatever. Um, but truth be told, I, I I always felt more like a feminine vessel. But was I really um, so um, wanting to be a woman per se? No, not really. I, I really actually enjoyed me. I really did. Um, I actually enjoyed my androgynous state of being. I was really happy being me. But again, um, in that short amount of time, you're talking about late '90s, um, early 2000s. Again, things were. Are you a boy or are you a girl? And like I said, I knew I was not going to get up in the morning put on a suit. So I said, well, you know what? I'll choose the latter. I'll choose the lesser of the two. You know? Um, and it worked. Like I said, I have no regrets. I definitely um, really acclimated and really happy in who I am. But if anyone who actually knows me, not to say that this means anything I was right, I don't wear dresses. I don't like them. I'm actually not really. Um, I don't know, I consider myself to be moderately feminine. Um, I, I don't really care for extremes either way. So I think if I had to, um, if I had to be transitioning at 16 in this day and age, no, I don't think I would have chosen my hair at all. I do not. Um, I think that I would have been a lot more fluid in nature. Um, and that's what I love about this generation. This generation is simply laying claim to their humanity opposed to um, being put into a box. Um, so I want to get into a little bit of your work, like your work today, what you're doing. Um, but you recently got an award uh, from Howard Brown Health Center. Um, and I asked you about that. When I first asked you about it, um, you said something that really stood out for me. Because it was about getting an award and getting recognized and you were saying something about, to the effect of you're getting recognized for something that um, people should just be doing for the work that they should yeah. do. And that things are so bad in uh, direct services, perhaps, that people aren't doing their job. So when someone does their job, they kind of get recognized for it. If that makes any sense. That makes perfect sense. And I think that that is really telling that we give individuals awards for things that they ought to be doing. It's kind of the same principle of a kid getting ten dollars per A. It's like, what do you mean? You're supposed to get an A, right? Um, or I'm going to give you the, um, twenty bucks for cleaning your room. No, you're supposed to clean your room. So I guess it feels the same for me. It's just like I'm, it's it's an amazing honor. It's an amazing privilege when the community recognize that you're doing something for them. But again, just like you said, um, it's also really telling that you know. Um, I don't want to say there's not a bad service. I do not want to say that. I don't, even though I'm saying it, right? <laughs> um, I Again, I just feel like when somebody is singled out to get an award, that says that, hey, you're really separating from the rest who aren't doing so well. Um, and I feel like I would like to see us get to a place where good work is just commonplace across the board, and the reward that you get for your good work is the fact that you're not fired and that you're still getting paid. Um, that should be the reward. And you were, and specifically, it was about the CRS. For people who don't know who, what the Chicago Central Referral List is, can you explain what that is? Because it's about housing. So it's this tool that. I don't know, it's been around for a little while, I think. Um, and basically, it's a it's federally funded by the HUD. And you know what? I just began to put people on because it was something that was there. And I'm like, why is anybody using this thing? So why not just, maybe I should just put people on here. And before you know it, I just had like lines and lines of people coming to me for this tool that was really public. I'm like, you know, you don't even pull this up on your smartphone, right? And do this yourself. Um, but again, what that said is community providers are not even using and utilizing basic tools that the city has actually set in place to help people get out of homelessness. Um, there's, there's no reason why there should be 
lines and lines of people coming to me for two hands when there's a whole lot of other black actors out here. So that says that if the masses is still safe coming to just me, well, what is everybody else doing? <laughs> um, so you've been on the ground uh, hearing, you know, people's experiences mm -hmm. around uh, being homeless or experiencing homelessness or housing instability, and you put them on this referral list, for example, sure. so that they can get housing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is around the trans work that you're doing, you're also doing like gender, we're giving people referrals to like gender markers yes. or. Um, Health services, legal services, etc. Um, what have you learned um, about people who are experiencing homelessness or housing instability um, that you wish people knew, based on the like the stories that you're hearing? What have I learned that I would like for people to know, based off the stories that I'm hearing? Man, that is hard, and that's an understatement. I don't even have the language for. Um, and it's just really, really hard, and that people are out here honestly trying their best. Um, the one thing that really comes to mind is for those who are privileged enough to be able to give individuals a chance at employment or a chance at getting themselves off their feet, do it. Um, you know, I, I didn't come from a really disenfranchised background, however, at the end of the day, I'm still a black trans woman. And someone gave me a chance. And that chance meant the world and it changed my entire life, right? So I feel like when we're talking about um, these youth who are facing homelessness or housing instability, give them a chance. You know, give them a chance. Yes, their skill sets might not be up to par or where you want them to be, where they may not have the education behind their names, but give them a chance. And I promise you, um, under the right guidance, they will thrive. So that's really kind of what I have to say about that. And you identify as a community case manager. Um, <laughs> as, how, how is that different than a case manager? Like, how do you, like, you're adding a community partnership? That's a great question. <laughs> you know, with that being said, um, so my primary roles are um, Chicago House and University of Chicago. But, um, in that time, when I'm working with Chicago House, which my work is actually trans-specific, community that is non-trans comes in and sees my services. I'm really thankful that I have a director that actually allows that to happen, because technically speaking, my role is actually designated for trans people. But again, what that says is that there's a job in services. There's a drive in the department services for LGBTQ people of color, black and brown individuals. There's a drive in services for us. So a lot of times, the bulk of the work that I'm doing are actually for non-trans individuals. And I'm, again, I'm just thinking like, what is going on? So again, like I said, I feel like my role has organically turned into like this community case manager because throughout the course of my day sitting at my desk, I'm just like, how on earth did I end up with like 20 non-trans individuals that I'm doing stuff for in conjunction with the work that I'm doing right now that's in alignment with my role? So yeah, I, I feel like a traveling case manager or whatever. And you, you actually said that it was like 25% of the work that you're doing is trans-specific, but the bulk of it is uh, for MSM and Yes, federal people. Absolutely. How do you feel about the percentage being so small, given that uh, that there aren't that many resources of people who are knowledgeable that can work with the trans I feel good about that. And the reason why is because I believe that right now, um, as far as trans services are concerned, we're in a good place. Again, we could be in a place that um, we could be doing work, but that's good. We're in a good place. Howard Brown's doing an amazing job. We've got people like Dr. Mark Bell at Schroger. Um, we've got well-intentioned people at Chicago House, so on and so forth, right? So I feel like the trans services that are happening right now, particularly for youths, it's really important for them. Um, but you have other populations, um, non-trans, cis, hetero, um, black-identified males. 
their services are just like after they're 25, that's it. That's it. It's like, what are they going to do? Um, same with cis um, females, um, hetero or lesbian identified. Same thing. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you're 25? And right now, my active investment where I see my um, career going is preparing youth to be 25. I feel like, you know, we, we're in this, we live in this city right now where when you're under 25, great, here's everything home, here's all these things, here's your own district of bus cars, and here's food, and here's snacks. Oh, sorry, you're 25, you gotta go. You know, and what are we doing? What are we doing to really prepare our youth to actually be stable? When I work at these youth drop-ins and I see youth, I'm like, you are not 25, right? Um, but I get it, I get it. There's, there's this desperateness to be able to get these suckers still. Um, because like I keep on saying, they're just not adequately prepared to be 26, 27, and beyond. So I'm gonna move in, thank you, Shannon. I'm gonna move into the questions that people are asking here. And just remember for people, and now I don't know what the number is because I can't see it, but it's 708 uh, 713 I'm gonna give some of that. Um, <laughs> uh, so the first question I have is, what does it mean? It's very broad, just so you know. Um, I didn't write it. It's all right. I like broad questions. All right. Okay. No, sh no shame. Uh, what does it mean to be black and trans? That's a great question. Um, you know something? I think I think that's, that's that varies from individual to individual. My my black trans experience is not. Another person's black trans experience. My black trans experience is based off of a lot of things. It's based off of my family background. It's based off of cis normative privilege. Um, it's based off of um, having a job, having employment, having it's based off of a lot of things. So I think to, to make a statement is to like um, I can't make that's that's kind of like a really blanketed answer to give that. Um, but I will say this, that um, it can be nerve-wracking. Um, it can be really unnerving to walk down the street and fear of your black body, you know, every day. Um, so, other than that, I, I can't answer that because I'll be speaking for everybody. You know? um, do you have a supportive network of colleagues that you work directly with at Chicago House? I don't know if some of your colleagues are here. I do. You want to shout out I say that. I say that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I know. I do. They're watching from the live right stream. Right there, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but I have like other colleagues that aren't necessarily Chicago House. I got my friend Zolai from Howard Brown. He's around here somewhere. I think he ran off. <laughs> You're somewhere. Testing. He's where? Helping out with the testing. Oh, hey, Zolai. Right there. There you are. Hey. <laughs> yes, I've got like quite a few people throughout the community that are like really amazing and supportive. And I mean, I would trade for you. They become colleagues and friends. Well, uh, who do you, who, why do you think it's hard for trans women to access services in community organizations? What, keep, what keeps them from coming out? What keeps them from coming out with services? Um, I believe because, again, the services are just same old, same old, and they are not individually tailored. I believe that the services have a tendency to be, um, to be an attempt to cover very blanketed needs with the assumption that we all need the same thing, you know? Um, and I just think that that's what's needed. I think that we need to actually deal with individuals from a more holistic standpoint, opposed to just assuming that everyone wants a gender market change, you know? Um, we need to stop us from there. Everybody wants a name change. Um, that everyone wants to take hormones. We have to begin to really do a lot more effective individualized work. Um, do you personally feel that there is discrimination in the public services available to transgender people? I was like, of course not. Yes. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. You said, is there, is there discrimination? Do you personally feel like there is discrimination in the public services available to transgender people? Sure. I do. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and if so, can you tell us about it? <laughs> <laughs> that was the follow-up question. <laughs> 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 
If so, can I tell them about it? The discrimination. I believe that the discrimination is very subtle at times. I don't think that it's necessarily. I, I feel like anyone with good sense is not going to tell you, yes, I'm discriminated against you, trans person. You know. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, I believe that there are a lot of biases when it comes to um, providers doing work for trans identified individuals. Um, it's, 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 it's in ways I can't really express. Um, it's one of those things where you know it, you see it, and you hear the stories from the individuals who have incurred these um, injustices. What are some ways a person working in the healthcare field can better advocate for transgender people? Well, it's funny because I was thinking about um, advocates and allies before, and I once said, if everybody speaks for everyone, then eventually who will have a voice, right? So at some point, we have to begin to encourage the populations that we work with to use their own voice. Um, I, I, I do believe it is my job to help you to navigate systems that are otherwise really difficult for you to, um, for you to learn and grasp and um, maneuver through. But still, I'd be remiss as a provider to not put the wheel back into their hands and take control of their own destiny. Um, and then there was, sorry, there was one that says, what advice uh, can you give a 27-year-old black cis lesbian? Wow. They are asking that question. <laughs> You're working now, Shannon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. What well, was? I think we're about to make a no, hold, hold on. Right. What, advice can you give, what advice can you give to a 27-year-old black cis lesbian who is in search of accessible health resources? 27-year-old black cis lesbian that is in search of health resources. I feel like right now Howard Brown is doing an amazing job when it comes to that. I um, that's my warm handle. Um, I do. I feel like Howard Brown is really doing great when it comes to um, women's services. You know, I really do. And I depend on what side of town that she's on. I'm not really sure. Um, that's one thing. I'm not really sure what side of town she's on. Um, but I, I, I do. I feel like Howard Brown is doing a great, uh, great job with that. But again, she should. Um, we kind of figure out what she on the side of town she's on. Um, depending on what side of town she's on, utilize those resources, inbox me, find a way to contact me, I will help you out the best way I can. Yes. All right. Perfect. Great. Perfect. Well, <laughs> what advice would you give someone who's starting off in the public health field working with LGBT youth? Is there one thing you could tell someone? It's um, a part of being a we're a great provider is to first actively listen, you know, and I think that's the most important is to listen. Um, your client is an expert in them, expert in their experience. Um, don't take that from them and realize that you're working to better, you're working for them to get a better life, um, not the other way. I have two more questions. No, it's totally fine. Um, I also want to ask you something like, what's my favorite color? Oh, I'm going to get to um, <laughs> what has been the hardest part about being a community case manager? Everything. <laughs> What's the hardest part about being a community case manager? <laughs> um, that I um, freaking like walk on water and I don't get tired. Um, and I'm not entitled to having a bad day. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to have a bad day. Um, what are some of your favorite books? My favorite book is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. It's one of my favorite books. Um, and also, there is a book by Tana Easy Coates that I really like. And um, why the heck can I remember the name of it right now? Yes, thank you. Between the World and Me. Yes, that is absolutely one of my favorite books. Um, yeah, so yeah, those two. All right, so I have, I have two more questions. Totally fine. Um, so 
Honestly, I'm getting so many awesome questions for you. Like, sure. I'm getting like referrals for real. Okay. So, okay, please add Shannon Lynn Parker on Facebook <laughs> and, and ask her there. Um, but I, if you are following Shannon on social media, on Facebook specifically, um, you would know that you were in a relationship for the past seven years. Yes. Right? And that recently, um, you're you're separating from your partner now. Sorry, I'm not gonna end up with like it's okay. No, 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 um, no, it's fine. Can you tell us how that how that started seven years ago? Um, I know y'all no, know what the hell is yeah, you, know, you know what? I love this stuff. I actually I do. I'll get into that. All right. Why I love it. Anyway, how did it start? How did we meet? No, I'm not even mad. But like, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the, the basically you're separating? Um, and what are you learning from that process? Oh, that's, that's great. Okay, so here's what I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. As a trans woman, a lot of times um, the zenith of our femininity is to partner with somebody, preferably a cis hetero male, right? And when that all falls apart, we're just like, Oh my God! I just lost all my value as a woman. And what will I ever do? Was ever going to love me ever again? To try to make people really accept me and yada 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 all that other stuff. I've learned that that couldn't be the furthest from the truth. I am a ring collector. This is my second one. Maybe I'll. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't want that, it's like, what is wrong with you? Um, so I learned that my femininity, my femaleness, who I am, is not contingent upon being validated by being a wife, by having a title, by being these states. My, my partner is a lovely, lovely, lovely man, but I believe that love is evolutionary. And what I needed when I was 20 something is just not what I need at this present age. Y'all won't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I mean, right? Five year olds do know what love is. It's just that you love you because you share crayons. And 17 year olds love because you carry my books and you walk me down the hall and do it to prom and you dress like a great America. You know, <laughs> love is just evolutionary, and what I need in this chapter of my life just is a little different now. That's all. That's Thank all. you for sharing. What is my favorite color? Oh my god, um, it used to be blue. And I think it still is. I think it is. I think it's like cerulean. That's what it's like. I think it's like a powdery. Like it's true. It's kind of like a powdery sort of thing. Right. And if you could change the system to make things fair for trans people, if there was something you could do in the next, say, six months, Jan, yes. um, what would that be? You know something I think we've discussed, and one of the things that I actually said, honestly, again, it's not by far anywhere near perfect for trans people at all. But what I really see, I see the real problem being for trans people of color. So if anything, if there's any system that I would like to change, I would like to change how black and brown people are being treated in society across the board. And once that happens, I believe that will trickle down to trans people and the other um, populations that are under that. And um, then we'll see some authentic change happening. But I think that we really can't zero in on that specific population until we talk about the broader context, which is the way that black and brown people are being treated. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was the last question. Thank you. Thank you.